we've got a wonderful uh, variety of academics, community leaders, uh, policy experts, researchers in the room, and you're all very welcome uh, this evening. Um, we've had a, uh, I spoke at an event on general Islamophobia, on the persecution of the Rohingya Muslims, or the persecution uh, of cultural genocide, one might say, of the Uyghurs, um, the, and most recently of all, the, um, the horror, the, the, the renewed horror, really, in Srebrenica and in Srpska. Um, the, this book uh, was, a, let's talk a little bit about why I chose to write it, because um, 20 years ago I was, um, I, I worked at a very prestigious title, uh, the Spectator magazine, which um, is known for its um, very uh, moderate and well-mannered views about British Muslims these days. Um, and actually the editor at the time was a certain Boris Johnson, who's never been heard of since. And um, I, in this capacity, I, in the uh, awful things happened, 9-11 um, happened, and 7-7, terrible atrocities. Uh, and I was, uh, in my um, capacity as political uh, correspondent, I would write about them. But I, I did notice one thing in the uh, British press, which was the awful way in which my colleagues and uh, in other papers and in our own, actually, sometimes, um, dealt with um, Muslims. Uh, and the way that the, again, you get the, as in Trojan Horse, as in uh, the Grooming Gangs narrative, you have a collaboration between the mainstream press, mainstream politicians, Labour as well as Tory, um, and, the, uh, and the far right, in demonising a community. And um, as, as I studied these stories uh, and realized quite uh, how, t how terrible they were, I, I decided that I, tried to, I, I needed to understand how, how they came about. And part of the book is, a, is history. And the Muslims have a very grisly fate, indeed. But this uh, this narrative is very important for the modern state of Israel because the, the 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 political backing from the evangelical right in the states is very formative in the construction of modern U.S. foreign policy, um, which of course uh, is very dismissive of um, Arabs, and, in, whether they're, and, and by the way, these evangelical <laughs> Zionists, uh, they don't really distinguish between Muslim Arabs, I don't think, and Christian Arabs. They don't, I don't think they really get the point of it. You know, the, the, the Christians have been there in, for actually rather a long time. <laughs> they have been there, some of them, for 2,000 years. They're not regarded with any favor by many of these. They don't want to hear about Islamophobia, and why don't they want to hear about Islamophobia? Because they are Islamophobic, structurally Islamophobic. They produce the lies. They manufacture them in factories around uh, what used to, be, used to be called Fleet Street, both in terms of stories and also in terms of analysis. Now, I, it doesn't upset me, though. I think at least they could do the courtesy of reviewing the book and engaging with the arguments. But there's none of that. They just pretend so far that it doesn't exist. Look, it's wonderfully written, wide-ranging, and well-argued. And I say this um, partly based on obviously reading the book, but also the presentation that uh, Peter gave. And it's difficult to encompass in this short time the range of things that um, Peter tries to connect and make, um, make visible to us or act as a reminder. This may explain why and certain newspaper outlets perhaps haven't been uh, fulsome in even discussing the book. It's actually um, written, and I mean this in a, in a very way, by a journalist who actually takes the craft of journalism seriously. I think there is an issue about journalism as being um, 
a way of writing the first draft of history, talking back to uh, power, giving the voiceless voices. That seems to be, have, to be forgotten in a lot of contemporary journalism. See the way this works. It's not just because the media does things independently. The media is linked in with particular way of political projects, particular ideologies, and as such, it is part of the politics and governance. It pretends to stand outside politics, but it is actually a political party. And it is basically what you have seen is a kind of murderization of the media, including public service broadcasting. And that has been to the detriment of society as a gen in general, rather than just specifically. One of the difficulties about the book, and also its challenges, is the fact that it ranges across um, continents and different climes and different times. And it does so in an effort to actually show the web of Islamophobia that ensnares us all. And one of the things about this web is that it is, it is global in extent, it connects the local and the global, it connects individuals and institutions, it connects the very mundane to the very elaborate, and it acts as a way that we don't even realize all the connections because one of the things that it does is it constantly makes us forget. Under the froth of tweets and memes and other general paraphernalia, we simply don't have a way of remembering even the things and the order of things that they occurred. And that means that we lose a sense of the chain of citations, we lose a sense of chain of causality. So we are confronted by these things that we may vaguely remember happened. We don't know who did what and why it happened. The final point is simply this. The final, final point is this. And I promise it will be the fifth final point. Is democracy is often used to lecture Johnny Foreigner or as a slogan on a t-shirt. Perhaps what we need to understand is actually that if you are serious about democracy, we need to believe in it. And believing in democracy means that we need to believe in diversity. And I think Peter's book makes a fantastic case for that.